Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shed. Now uh, the UK is in a bit of an Indian summer at the moment so apologies if you can uh, uh, see the sweat on my furrowed brow as uh, as I put this video together. Um, but today's video is all about these uh, records uh, and turntables and why in the 1970s, 80s and into the 90s a debate raged about whether or not one should buy a belt drive turntable or a direct drive turntable. Now, of course, a lot of this is personal preference, and I was actually reading in What Hi-Fi uh, over the weekend that even today uh, there's a big split between those buyers who want uh, a direct drive versus a belt drive turntable, and the arguments are still the same as they were, as I say, back in the 70s and 80s. And in reality, uh, so much of the belt drive come uh, direct drive war is literally a war of words because 95% of the population wouldn't be able to discern the difference between two sources, even if they tried really hard. And that's because the frequency responses, the frequencies which a lot of people talk about um, with the disadvantages of direct drive turntable, a majority of us, certainly over the age of 21, wouldn't be able to detect anyway. And there was actually a, a piece of research done with an audience, uh, I think it was in Nippon Columbia Laboratories in Japan, uh, in about 1979, 1980, where they actually put uh, a belt drive and a direct drive turntable uh, next door to one another. I believe it was in an anechoic room as well, so there was absolutely no other noise that could be heard. And uh, they played a very quiet piece of classical music through a very top end range uh, loudspeaker setup. And very few people could tell the difference. And I think that towards the end of that, there were about half a dozen of the 20 or so people in there that said they could hear it. They then did a slightly smaller focus group. They then played the same bit back and people couldn't discern the difference at all. In fact, they were sort of swapping and changing. And that same bit of research or a very similar bit of research was actually done by, I believe it was Marantz uh, in the mid nineties as well, uh, which were looking at different digital and analog sources. So there was the uh, DAT, DCC, CD player, and then there was a number of analog sources such as turntables, cassette decks, and open reel decks. And they, they did quite a mass piece of research, and I believe it was in the US and Japan, maybe also in Germany, but I'm not quite sure about that. They played exactly the same piece of music through all these different sources. They made their focus group sit through uh, what was about 20 or 25 pieces of music, the same piece of music repeated 25 times. And even then, the difference between analog and digital sources, a majority of the audience couldn't discern the difference. And I've always said that actually, if I play a well-recorded metal cassette on uh, my Nakamichi BX2 cassette deck, I play a mass-produced CD uh, on uh, one of the Technic CD players I've got, and I play a really well-mastered piece of vinyl on my new uh, direct drive linear tracking turntable, apart from the sort of snap, crackle and pop that you get from uh, vinyl is actually the quality uh, difference is negligible. And for some pieces of music, I think a digital source sounds much better, uh, whereas for some pieces of music, an analog source definitely sounds better, in my opinion. But this is highly subjective, and all of the videos that I do, whether or not this is on uh, audio or visual equipment, equipment is based upon my personal preferences. And each of us, of course, uh, has different preferences. And uh, and certainly when I'm listening to a pair of, what, 30 quid headphones at the moment, compared to some people that are listening to the same track, the same piece of music on a 200 pound pair of headphones, I'm not totally sure whether or not these big old lugs could really uh, tell the difference. And that's what leads me back to the discussion about direct drive and belt drive turntables. And the reason why I've sort of stirred this one back up again is because I'm actually selling a Sharp Optonica 5100 meant to be fully automatic turntable at the moment. 
And the reason I bought a direct drive, fully automatic turntable was one of usability because I'm lazy inherently and I didn't want to stand up and remove my own tone arm, uh, particularly when I'm working here at the computer. But also I wanted something that would work well in this sort of environment. So in a wooden built shed with a wooden floor, and if I turned up the volume a little bit on the old amp, then it wouldn't create huge amounts of uh, feedback uh, into the tone arm or stylus and tone arm and it was something that beset me as a as a youngster as a teenager when playing my dance music there would always seem to be a lot of interference a lot of feedback um particularly in turntables which didn't have a thick mat or a, or a well constructed platter so i set myself a challenge of looking for this direct drive turntable fell in love with the sharp of tonic of 5100 um and um and set about some work on it and by digging out the technical specs on, on the sharp model i actually dug out some older research that was done on direct drive and of course, direct drive uses often quartz locked uh, brushless DC motors to give an incredibly consistent uh, speed. So in other words, wow and flutter issues or speed variation and pitch variation on direct drive turntables was negligible. And what uh, the Technics or Matsushita Corporation did, and I think his name was uh, Abata, who uh, designed and uh, built the first direct drive brushless motor and integrated it into a turntable in about 1969. What he said is he wanted something which created um, uh, a low noise, a very easily built, very easily maintained uh, and mass producible solution for turntables. And it was really simple. It was effectively a control circuit, a brushless DC motor, uh, pop the uh, uh, pop the um, uh, the central thing. Uh, you know, God, it's terrible when you can't remember. But effectively, you uh, put the spindle through the motor. Record sits on a, a piece of rubber, and away you go. And that turntable could potentially last ad infinitum. And the success of the Matsushita product, which later became the SL series and the SL twelve hundred, so the world's most popular turntable ever having sold over a million units worldwide uh, in about uh, 10 years since it was uh, first launched, is these things were incredibly reliable. And what people found is that they could buy a relatively inexpensive direct drive turntable with a good quality stylus and cartridge assembly, plug it in, and that's it. Apart from replacing the stylus every several thousand hours, they needed to do nothing else. These things were built like as my mother would have said, brick outhouses. And that was the big difference with a lot of belt drive technology at the time, because belt drive is effectively a motor, a platter, and a rubber belt that goes between the two. And over time, as we know, rubber tends to perish and stretch, and therefore the speed instabilities, particularly over, over time and over uh, as the turntable ages, particularly if it hasn't been used, um, the actual performance reduces significantly and wow and flutter becomes a very a, a big problem, a very big problem in belt drive turntables, particularly some of the uh, older versions. So of course, uh, direct drive technology was met with huge applause and has pretty much been the gold standard of a lot of mass market turntables since the what mid 1970s and 80s and as i say direct drive turntables are still working today you know uh, models from that era you can literally plug them in and the speed stability on 33 and 45 will be much the same as it was uh, on the day they were made um, so I wanted to personally to be looking for a direct drive turntable. My ideal was to go for a linear tracking model initially, just something I could push the button and uh, forget. Um, and, um, and I came across the Sharp Optonica. Now, as I say, the research that I found out about this model since buying it was that it used a uh, Matsushita motor. So the DC brushless quartz locked motor uh, was produced by uh, Matsushita and then installed into the Optonica model. And unfortunately, um, the Optonica machines were quite plasticky 
Uh, they didn't have an awful lot of damping in them, but the sound quality was exceptional, not only just because of the, the quality of the motor, but the tone arms, uh, they were often fitted with autofund cartridges and styli. So the actual sound quality was pretty good and they actually looked great as well. But they, uh, like a lot of over-engineered uh, Japanese products at the time, is Sharp Optonica decided to use logic circuits it's that they hours. used in uh, their upright linear tracking mass market models. They used those logic circuits and they put them into a range of direct drive turntables. Now, that gave them functionality. So it gave them semi-automatic or fully automatic functionality, but it also made them inherently reliable, uh, unreliable. So you had this amazing motor that potentially would have lasted 50 years, 100 years or whatever, but the front end, the circuitry on them was notoriously flaky. And interestingly, I didn't do my research. So I bought this turntable absolutely perfect bit of kit. I bought a new stylus, a new cartridge. Uh, it was in impeccable condition, including the plate glass lid on this. So not plastic or acrylic, this was a plate glass lid. Plugged it in, switched it on, and I thought, yeah, I've got it. This is the perfect turntable for me. Within 24 hours and about half a dozen records being played on it, the LEDs were flashing on the front panel, and that's it the chips frazzled. And this was an inherent problem in this model and in a lot of Optonica come sharp models at the time, that the logic circuits were being asked to do far too much for the technology, for the switching technology that was built into those microprocessors. So now what I'm left with is a really great manual turntable, which sounds superb and looks very much the part as you'll see in the photos, but unfortunately, the fully automatic mode don't work anymore. So for me and my personal circumstances of wanting this automation, I'm now selling it, um, which is a bit of a side because you'll find that on uh, on my Facebook and uh, eBay page. But nevertheless, is this turntable and the, the direct drive nature of this turntable was exactly what I wanted. So therefore, I went out and bought a Technics SL1 direct drive linear tracking turntable. And I'm going to talk about linear tracking on a on a different video at some time in the in the near future. Because linear tracking and that whole swathe of 80s technology which would allow record players to play records upside down on their end, you know, up on Mars or whatever, is that was born out of effectively just taking the tone arm and, and putting it in a, in a linear or upright mode. And of course, Sharp made a really big thing about this, that you could play both sides of the record on a music center, which was effectively standing on its side, something that really caught the imagination of a lot of uh, home audio buyers pretty much all over the world. The, the, the units sold were in their millions. Um, unfortunately, very few of them now exist because they were built to a very tight budget. Uh, they made a lot of profit on them, um, but the consumers often found that within five or 10 years, they were uh, dead as a doornail. So linear tracking certainly had its fans, and I was a really big fan of the Technics decks at the time, and the one I've bought is, is by far the best turntable I've had for a number of years. Um, but again, they have their technical um, uh, inadequacies, I think you could say, uh, but more on that when we talk about them. Um, but uh, belt drive, now you see, belt drive technology, as I say, is really simple. There's a motor here, the central spindle here, and the tone arm here. So effectively, what the audio files will tell you is that by moving the motor, as far away as possible from the pickup device, you effectively reduce any hum and noise or motor noise that you would normally find on a direct drive model. Now, I know that DC brushless motors, servo controlled and quartz locked, actually make very, very little noise. And the best way you can, you can uh, monitor this yourself is by playing a record with very low output, so a very quiet piece of classical music. You pop the same record on a belt drive turntable as a direct drive turntable, 
and you watch how your woofers, your bass drivers move on your loudspeakers. And that's a very good measure of, of subsonic noise or noise that's being picked up by the stylus and the cartridge. And actually, if you look at a pair of, you know, pretty good drivers, whether or not they be paper or Kevlar or plastic or whatever they may be, and you actually look at the wobble, um, uh, very few people, as I say, can notice the difference visually and certainly acoustically. I, I can seldom tell the difference between belt drive and direct drive. But uh, in my uh, younger years, so around my 20s, I had a, a dual CS505-2 turntable, which was, again, an incredibly uh, uh, great selling, uh, really great selling turntable, uh, one of sonically the best belt drive turntables ever built, uh, and was a really good piece of kit. It had very good damping on it, so you couldn't actually... Uh, you didn't get any feedback. The motor noise was very low. Uh, the belts were at that time incredibly easy to get hold of, so it was easy to uh, replace the belt. And it was a really nice turntable. But of course, belt drive turntables are more akin to uh, a, 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 a home audio buyer than they would ever be a professional buyer. So, you know, going back to that direct drive model, the Technics SL 1200, you've got DJs all over Europe, chucking them into a, a hold on a plane, putting them into a, a, a you know, a, a kit bag, um, throwing them onto their DJ box in Mykonos or in Crete or wherever it may be, uh, playing the sets throughout the summer and then chucking them back onto a plane uh, to come back to Manchester or wherever or Birmingham in the winter. And these things were being thrown all over the place, whereas belt drive decks were inherently a lot more, uh, as I say, open to uh, abuse. And it didn't. It doesn't matter whether or not you were just leaving them on your sideboard listening to a, a, a few records now and again, is the technology itself, the belt itself became worn, um, and saggy and then as i say you ended up with speed problems so belt drives were very much more akin to uh, as i say audio files a lot of people who were very close to the audio file market believe they sounded much better i.e you didn't have the motor noise um and so belt drives suddenly became a lot more popular and unfortunately that meant is that a lot of less expensive manufacturers uh, i.e. producing these things on a budget of 20 euros or 20 dollars or less uh, produce pretty crappy belt drive turntables because remember you could source a motor for a couple of cents a belt cost a couple of cents you could put together a chipboard platter uh, or a chipboard um, uh, base and a cheap old uh, cast platter for you know for less than a, a, a few euro so therefore you were able to keep the costs maybe under a tenner at landed cost and sell them for less than 50 pounds and that created this plethora of rubbishy crappy uh, turntables that we see today often originating from one or two factories in the far east and so therefore the whole of the record player market was cheapened by these thrown together plastic models often belt drive which sounded really poor but of course, there's been a resurgence in, viral, uh, in vinyl sales. And it's really interesting to me that where we've seen this resurgence, and there is a little resurgence going on about cassettes at the moment, but we'll do a separate video on cassettes. Where you see a resurgence in the market is you also start to get a resurgence in this polarization. So whether or not direct drive is better than belt drive, uh, what's a transcription deck, why should I buy one brand rather than the other? And those same arguments which I was listening to in 1986 are being uh, thrashed out this time on social media in 2019 and 2020. So it's quite amazing to me that exactly the same sort of rules apply. If you're serious about music, buy belt drive. If you want something which is um, uh, a bit longer lasting, a bit more durable, then uh, direct drive. But this time, there's something slightly different happening, and that is about the fashion associated with buying vinyl. So the market is being driven at the moment by those between 20 and 30, age between, well, pretty much 
ages of 20 and, and 35 actually. And so the market is being driven ostensibly by uh, vintage hi-fi people like myself, but also being driven by something that looks iconic, that will sit on a bookshelf, sit on a sideboard, sit on a, a bench or a table within a, a modern home and look like an iconic piece of kit. And so again, the resurgence of this technology is being driven by amazing pieces of, uh, of direct drive tech that are being produced and also um, belt drive stuff as well. And there's a whole gamut, you know, from pretty much 49 quid up to thousands. I saw one the other day at four and a half thousand pounds. And, and it's all about the fashion status associated with vinyl technology. And just like the 80s, there's around 5% of the audience that really can tell the difference between a low-end budget turntable, or I shouldn't say that, a mid-band turntable and something higher end. So my recommendation is for longevity. And actually there are turntables available at the moment in lots of different places on Marketplace and, and uh, eBay, which absolutely tick the box when it comes to good quality sound. If they're direct drive, you can pretty much be assured that they will last forever. Um, don't buy one with lots of logic controls on it, as I found to my peril. Um, but as I say, that was a particular model. But stick to direct drive, get a really good quality unit, and then take a look at the tone arm. And what you're looking for is a universal tone arm that you can detach the current cartridge and stylus, particularly if you're buying vintage hi-fi. Remember that these cartridges and styli may have been on there for 30 years, so it's much better to buy a decent quality cartridge assembly with a new stylus, and then you know you've got a, effectively a brand new product sitting there to play your record collection. And to give you an idea, I bought recently an Audio Technica cartridge um, head shell and stylus assembly. So new old stock as it were for less than 40 pounds. So for the price of a turntable, what? Less than 100 pounds and a new cartridge stylus assembly that will attune itself to modern amplification uh, for 40 pounds, so for less than 150, you've got a really good turntable that should give you many, many, many uh, further years of service. Now, of course, if you want to go belt drive, then you have to check whether or not the motor still works, because often the motors were less expensive within uh, belt drive turntables. They, uh, they were multi-purpose motors uh, rather than being sole purpose motors, which were seen on direct drive. So motor failure is a greater issue and also belt failure is another issue and that is mainly down to age that most rubber belts will perish within a relatively short period of time so you should always budget into um, finding a belt for the belt drive model that you're buying and check that they're still available because not all belts for all turntables are still made or still available from some third party uh, suppliers. So just double check that belts are still available. And something that, that really hit home to me when I was looking at the linear tracking turntable is make sure that whichever deck that you buy has got the ability to change the cartridge and the stylus uh, or maybe even the head shell as well. So there are completely different sockets on different head shells from different manufacturers. Uh, and a quick look on Amazon or eBay will tell you that actually those sockets do vary. And certainly the prices for stylus and cartridge assemblies vary significantly. Um, so check that out as well. Um, and that's one of the things that when you're looking at the price of a turntable, that even if it's something for 40 or 50 quid, by the time you've factored in uh, maybe a new cartridge, uh, uh, head shell, stylus, uh, belt, and maybe even a, a rubber mat, a new rubber mat for it, that you could be doubling or even tripling that price, even if cartridges and styli are available for that particular model. So lots of things to look out for uh, when you're buying a turntable. Um, as I say, my preference is always direct drive. I find the speed stability, I find the look, the feel, and the longevity of the units 
to be far better than a lot of their belt drive uh, compatriots. But saying that, if I could get my hands on a really good, well looked after dual CS5052, I'd most likely buy that too. Um, but less so for operation in, in here, in the shed, but more of something that I could use within uh, the house, which is a, a a little more secure and not built of uh, not built of timber. So that's just a brief canter through the big argument between belt drive and direct drive turntables. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, and of course, I'm more than happy uh, to put my views forward in discussions as well, because so much of this is personal preference. And if you like me have got records dating back to 1984 and thereabouts, then frankly, these things have been in use for uh, 30, 30 or more years. You're unlikely to be able to tell the difference between a decent belt drive and a decent um, direct drive deck. On quieter passages of music, that's where you are gonna notice the difference. But whichever you buy, direct or belt drive, invest in a good stylus, invest in a good cartridge, make sure the records are clean. And once you've done that, you will get the best possible output from your analog source, from your turntable. Now, of course, there is uh, the elephant in the room, which is the 20 or 30 quid turntable that you can get from high street stores or supermarkets pretty much all over Europe. And, you know, I've tested a couple of these before. Um, so there are some models which are built by uh, Audio Technica or, or come out of that stable, usually over £150, so over €200, Euros, which are actually not bad decks. And they're actually um, aesthetically very similar to the iconic Technics SL1200. And they're OK. And there's certainly a, a model at the moment which Sony are selling, uh, which is also a really good quality turntable with both line phono outputs as well as uh, USB um, outlets and, and relative software. But those cheaper turntables, those things that look like an old fashioned radiogram or they look like, um, I don't know, something vintage and whatever, frankly, they're took. And, and I wouldn't touch them with, uh, with your barge pole, frankly. And whilst they have interchangeable styli and, uh, you know, they will play 33, 45s and even 78s, some of them, the actual piece of kit themselves are really poor. And, uh, and frankly, whilst they're convenient and some of them may look OK um, to be put on a sideboard or maybe in a kid's room, if you've got a vinyl collection or you're serious about digging your vinyl collection out of the loft or like myself, enjoy going to secondhand stores and bring and buy sales and jumbles and picking up uh, one of those records that really uh, reminds you of the past, then do yourself a favor, get yourself a good basic turntable, change the stylus and cartridge, a good basic amplifier and a good set of speakers. And that will give you the very best possible reproduction in sound quality. And whilst it may cost a few quid more now, it should give you a lot longer lifespan than a cheapo bit of plastic for 50 quid, which I guarantee is going to last just about the length of the warranty. So 12 months or two years. So, um, yeah, I, as we all know I'm a bit of a hi-fi fan and certainly a bit of a vintage hi-fi fan. But my recommendation is if you're a little bit serious about it, spend a little bit more. So uh, that's it for now, a brief canter through turntables. I'll pop some pictures of the Sharp Optomica 5100 uh, onto my Facebook page and also onto this video as well, if you're interested. Uh, so for now, have a great day and sorry about the notifications that are pinging in the background, uh, but I wanted to get this uh, video out there because uh, I'm gonna be talking a lot more about turntable and analog technology uh, over the next few weeks. So have a good one and uh, speak to you soon. Cheers from the shed. Bye.